I will admit to you the relative humor I found in the fact that um, I preached not more than two or three weeks ago on this same passage, but in a different gospel. And the challenge it faces when you've already said what you kind of wanted to say about this same passage, but just in a different gospel, means you've got to think about it in a different way. And that has been what has consumed my mind this very busy lead up and into this first Sunday of Lent. And I couldn't decide, and I still don't know as I'm standing before you today, I'll admit that as we start off in Lent this first Sunday, I'm torn between thinking about the Spirit immediately driving Jesus out into the wilderness and what that means for us, and the very first words that Jesus proclaims in Mark's Gospel, which is the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near, repent and believe in the good news. So bear with me as I work this out with you and in front of you, in my mind and in my heart. I think starting with the Spirit driving Jesus out into the wilderness perhaps is a good place to begin. Mark does a very good job of setting the stage very, very economically in terms of word count. And one almost feels like in this account of Jesus' baptism, the first time that Jesus appears on the scene actually is here, that Mark is rushing to get to this last sentence that appears in this morning's reading because it is, after all, the announcement of all of the Gospels. It is what Jesus' mission is about. It is what his ministry will be about. It is what we will wrestle with to believe in the good news to this day. So I don't blame Mark for wanting to get through some of the little details and leaving it to the other gospel writers who were coming after him to kind of say, oh, well, what did that look like when Jesus was out in the wilderness for 40 days and was tempted by Satan? Uh, Mark, you left us nothing, man. There's nothing to think about. Something had to happen out there. And so we get Matthew and we get Luke's account, both of which take an entire chapter to fill up what happened in those 40 days out in the wilderness. But we know from Mark that he was there for 40 days. And the number 40 should be an interesting number for us and should make us think as the original Jews who heard this or read this, the first Christians read this, they would say, oh yes, 40 days, kind of like Noah and the flood, right? Our Genesis reading from this morning. Or, oh yeah, kind of like how the Israelites were out in the wilderness too, but for 40 years. Ah. So there is this number 40 that comes up in various times and this is one of them and where is Jesus he is in the wilderness he is crossed over the Jordan River he's just been baptized in it and the spirit fills him and immediately drives him out drives him out is not a good translation it doesn't give you the violence of what happens The translation, the true translation is, and the Spirit immediately threw him out into the desert. He didn't have a choice. He was picked up and whap, thrown out into the desert, into the wilderness. And what happens in the wilderness? Historically, it is where you meet God. For 40 years, the Israelites wandered around out there, and they had God with them day and night. So it is interesting that when Jesus, the Son of God, God incarnate, is out in that same wilderness, who shows up? Not God, but Satan. Here's where we're going off the track of everything I had planned out to talk to you about up to this moment. My brothers and sisters, I have been struggling this week with the school shooting and have been thinking about it with a number of people and have heard a number of opinions. You can't turn on the radio and I have a 12 minute drive. And for 12 minutes, that was a topic of conversation pretty much every morning this past week after this happened. And it makes me think of um, where is Satan alive in our world today? Where do we see the evil one, the tempter, show up for us? I was quite struck with um, I went down to Episcopal Advocacy Day in the State uh, House and went to the Senate session because our bishop was giving the invocation. I had given the invocation the previous Wednesday, so I kind of wanted to hear what he had to say about stuff and kind of compare notes. 
he did a pretty good job. Um, but I stayed to the end of the session, and I'm glad that I did. Um, there were a number of people that had stayed through most of the, there was some bills that were being heard, and, and people kind of trailed away after that. But I stayed to the end, and the last 15 minutes were, were, were historic in my mind, um, and very interesting to me, because they talked about the gun violence. And one of the, the Democratic senators stood up and said, you know, I just want to say, you know, uh, Mr. President, before we close, that um, I had to explain to my four-year-old why she shouldn't be afraid going to school this morning because she had heard about more people being killed. And that was a hard conversation for me to have. And I didn't have any of the answers for her, but she knows that I do things like make laws. And so she was wondering if we were going to make a law so that people wouldn't get killed in schools anymore. That was the start of what turned into 20 minutes of debate and conversation and outright frustration with where the Senate and the world seems to be in reaction to what happens when more children get killed in schools. But something very interesting happened towards the end, and I don't know who the senator was. I was up in the balcony, so I couldn't really see who everybody was, but it was someone towards the back and on the left-hand side as I was facing out who said, you know, um, we've talked a lot about a lot of things here this morning, but what we haven't talked about is um, the responsibility we have to our children and to our families to a higher power. And he said, that could be whatever you want to call it. I choose to call it God. And that we've not been bringing up our families and our children, and we've kind of ignored God and said, we are more important. I'm summarizing, so I don't have the actual transcript, but this is what I heard him say. That we have to be responsible to a higher power. We have to be called to something greater than ourselves. And we owe it to that greater power and to ourselves to do something about this. And then he apologized and said, I know I'm not supposed to bring God and religion and you know, separation of church and state, but that's what I feel. And I wanted to jump up and down. I wanted to go down. I wanted to like leap over the rail and go find that guy and give him a hug. This past Sunday, I preached a sermon on prophetic voice and how hard it is to stand up and say the thing that has to be said and to point to a God moment and say that we're either God is present or God is absent. And this guy had a prophetic moment. I want to find out who that guy is and go shake his hand or buy him a cup of coffee or just give him a hug or tell him that away or give him a high five or something. Because that took some courage. And it got me to thinking that, you know, it's easy sometimes for us to see God moments, but it's probably also easy for us to see temptation by Satan moments in our lives, if we're honest. And let's be real clear. Lent is set aside as a time for looking at ourselves, for self-examination, to see who we are as people. What is our soul like? How much in relationship with God are we? Where have we fallen away from that relationship with God? And how do we do the hard work of repent and believe, knowing that when we repent, which the Greek word is metanoia, which means literally make a 180 degree loop and start walking back towards God, not away from God. Knowing that God is there with open arms, ready to catch us and hold us fast. That sums up the repent and believe in the good news. Because the good news is that no matter how far away we stray from God, God is only standing there waiting for us to come to our senses about whatever it is we're doing that's taking us farther away and welcome us back home. Not with a chastising finger, but with a hug and embrace and love. Now, for each of us, this season of Lent will be different. And each of us, as I think about my life, every year I try and do something different. And I fail. <laughs> I try to give up not watching uh, so much television one year, and I fail. There's only one year, there's only one or two years where I really kind of made it all the way through Lent with the things I tried to give up. And the two years that I made it all the way through about the things I tried to give up were because they were hard, not because they were easy. One damn near killed me. I decided I was going to go meat-free and be, be vegetarian for Lent. And I've got to tell you, that was hard. This Metasaurus standing in front of you almost did not make it. 
I think that we've come to a place in Lent in our hearts where we give up something easy like chocolate because that's denying ourselves something, like Jesus denied himself those 40 days in the wilderness. And I think that's wrong. I think we can do more than that. I think we can dig deeper than that. And I think our souls need us to. And I don't know what the give up is for you, but I'm kind of tired of giving up. I think I'd rather want to do some metanoia work instead and turn my heart and my mind and maybe even my body back towards God and start walking towards God again, believing in the good news and repenting. I'll get to that in a minute. When we say repenting, this is the other thing I want to say about this and then I think I'll be done. When we say repenting, we have a lot of emotion wrapped up in that word. Repent has a lot of wretchedness in it, a lot of guilt in it, a lot of acknowledging how horrible we are in it. And for some reason, I think that's okay. Because it serves as a darn fine motivator, doesn't it? Guilt is one heck of a motivator. But it also tears you down in the process of motivating. It tears you down. It makes you want to metanoia, but with a heavy heart, not with a, okay, I've come to my senses. I'm awake and I'm ready to go. Which is what repent really means for us. Somewhere along the line, us humans have decided it would be good to beat ourselves up during Lent instead of simply turning around and walking back towards God, which is all God wants us to do anyway. A priest friend of mine said in a blog post of his that he was tired of giving up meaningless stuff, and instead he was going to take on something, and that he wanted to do some work around that. And what he said was, he wanted to give up feeling like there wasn't any hope left. And this came out the morning of the school shooting. And he said, I want to give up feeling hopeless like I, don't ha- like I can't do anything or that the world is somehow out of my control and that all I can do is sit there and wallow in this horrible feeling I have every couple of weeks. Do you know there have been eight school shootings in seven weeks in this year so far? There have been 18 times when a gun has been discharged on a school property since January 1st. If you don't think we have a gun problem in this country, I don't know what else has to happen for us to admit, admit that. I am fi- I'm going to go out on a limb and this, people may give me flack and that's okay. If you got to give me flack, great. Wait till Thursday till I've had a couple of days to kind of come to my senses about stuff perhaps. But you know what? How can the answer be to gun violence, more guns? I don't get it. I don't understand it. And if someone wants to, to explain that to me, boy, I am all ears. Because I, I want to think that maybe if they're right, great. Lay it out for me. I want people to own guns. If they want to own guns, that's fine. But we have 3,000 times more guns than anybody else on the planet. We've got more school shootings than any other nation on earth combined. Combined all the other school shootings last year of every other nation. And we've got more. Where I see Satan is Satan dividing us, Satan killing us, Satan giving us the opportunity, Satan making us crazy that we, don't, we can't find any help for the mental illness we have. We feel alone, we feel isolated, we feel lonely, and then we go pick up a gun and shoot someone. God has to weep at that, and Satan has to laugh with delight. You don't have to try real hard to find Satan in the world. Just like you don't have to try too hard to find God in the world. My hope for us this Lent, my brothers and sisters, is that we can find moments where we realize that we have walked farther away from God and not closer. We look in our souls and see what it is that we do that are us that takes us farther away from God by our thoughts, by our words, by our actions. And we do this so that we can get what Jesus said and get his mission and what he wants us to believe more than anything else. Repent. Turn around and believe that God is waiting there to welcome us back to the kingdom. Amen.